he is not your ordinary philosopher at a department of philosophy philosopher. His previous books includes on humor, the book of dead philosophers, a book I have not read, but only the, even, uh, the, only the title is, uh, is worth the price. It's called How to Stop Living and Start Worrying. <laughs> There's a book on the Hamlet Doctrine. He has a book on David Bowie. He has written on soccer or football. It's even been translated into Norwegian. David Tenkepo, Novi Tenkepo, football. So his philosophy can broadly be characterized uh, by the fact that it seeks to bring into philosophy things and topics and themes from outside philosophy and by the same token uh, the other way around, bringing philosophy into what is outside philosophy. He has done uh, a lot of work about, uh, on, on topics which are more traditionally thought of as being typical philosophical uh, topics. He has done work on Levinas, for instance, or on Heidegger. But being a British philosopher, uh, even his uh, strong interest in so-called continental philosophy, German, French philosophy, shows a tendency of, uh, uh, shows a willingness to bringing into uh, his own domain things from the outside. So, to put it a bit unfairly, when all the Brit British philosophers agreed that the French Jacques Derrida was one of the wild French ones and not a philosophy worthy of the name, uh, Critchley brought out a book on the ethics of deconstruction. Philosophy, in order to not end in this endless series of footnotes to Plato and to each other, is in constant need of uh, renewal. And one way of renewing philosophy is precisely to bring it into contact with non-philosophical uh, matter. And his last book, Critch's last book, is on tragedy, which is an older art form, an older literary form uh, than uh, philosophy, uh, and which is also uh, belong to the category of non-typical philosophical uh, forms. The writing of philosophy more or less uh, started in the generation of Socrates and Plato and by the time of Aristotle was an accomplished fact. And Socrates was a contemporary of uh, the Greek uh, drama and Plato's, uh, I don't know if, if, if Socrates even could write, but he left nothing in writing. Plato did but his form is the dramatic dialogue, uh, and it can be seen uh, in some respects as being a way of uh, presenting a challenge to the traditional literary forms of ancient Greece. He expelled famously Homer from his ideal republic, uh, and also the Greek drama was a problem to him that he sought to conquer with his own kind of literary form, which in its turn turned into the genre of philosophy. Uh, that being said, the <clears throat> topic of Greek tragedy is also in its own way a, a, a traditional uh, or a, an established subject within philosophy. I think when we hear um, uh, the words philosophy and Greek tragedy, the philosophy Greek tragedy connection, uh, most of us will recall the name of Friedrich Nietzsche and his famous book on the birth of tragedy. Even those who haven't read it have heard about it in one way or another. Behind Nietzsche, there's a name of no less stature, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Uh, and uh, Hegel's philosophy, part of it arguably started in his uh, reading of uh, Greek tragedy. And if not, <coughs> if not, uh, all students of philosophy have heard about it. At least students of literature have, have read or heard about uh, uh, Hegel's famous analysis of Sophocles' tragedy Antigone. 
And you are writing about uh, this Hegel uh, connection here and discussing uh, in, in, what way, in what way Hegel's dialectic can be related to, the, to his readings in Greek uh, tragedy. A little after Nietzsche, all good things are three. Um, there's, of course, the name of Sigmund Freud, who is not a philosopher in a limited sense of the term, but who invented the idea of the Oedipus complex. And the idea of the Oedipus complex arguably is the greatest, or at least one of the great late after effects of ancient Greek tragedy. And I think that modern interest in Greek tragedy actually is due to a large degree to the interests in Greek tragedy by philosophers uh, of, the, of the kind I mentioned here. Had it not been for Hegel, Nietzsche, and Freud, uh, modern interest in, in Greek tragedy would probably have been less. Of course, the philosophers are not only responsible for our interest in Greek tragedy. There is a theater tradition, uh, it's literature, and so on. But uh, the philosophers, I think, play an important role in, in, uh, in keeping alive uh, the discussion about the old Greek tragedy. So in this sense, Mr. Simon Critchley uh, belongs to a proud tradition of philosophers discussing tragedy. What is Greek tragedy? I'm going to leave it to him to explain that to us. But I just remind the audience about a few basic facts. It's an art form which developed in Greece, mainly in Athens, in the, what do you say, the fifth century, the sixth and fifth centuries before common era. And there are three important names to be known. The oldest is Aeschylus, Aeschylus, the next one is Sophocles, Sophocles, and the third one is Euripides, Euripides. And we have seven tragedies in the name of Aeschylus, we have seven tragedies in the name of Sophocles, and we have around 17 tragedies in the name of Euripides. So we have some 30 or 31 uh, extant tragedies. And uh, if not all of them, then most of them are translated into Norwegian, so they can be read in, 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 in Norwegian. Uh, and all of them, of course, are translated into the uh, great European uh, languages, for instance, English. In series like Penguin Classics and Oxford World Classics, they are easily available. But only a very few of them are commonly read and, or, and commonly known. Uh, Sophocles, uh, King Oedipus, Antigone, uh, the Oresteia by Aeschylus, and a few others. Um, but it appears from this, man this is uh, Simon Critchley's latest book. It's not yet a book, but a bunch of papers. But in this corpus he deals with, I don't know if he deals with all of them, but he does not only concentrate on the few most famous tragedies, but you know, actually deals with the whole corpus. So I think I'll get, leave, leave the word now to Mr. Critchley. When he is finished, um, we have a, a, a short break, then we'll meet again for a discussion. I'm uh, supposed to comment on what he's saying, but I don't know what he's going to say. So I have to listen carefully. But you too. So I hope we will, we will uh, end up here having a, a, a dialogical form, asking him questions and going on from what he has told us to begin with. Will you please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Simon Critchley. And uh, thank you to Jan Inge for the invitation to come here. And um, I've been to Norway many times, but never been to Stavanger. And 
I'm very happy to be here. And that was a very good introduction, very, very interesting, because there's uh, lots I could say in relation to that. And at the risk of sounding like a, uh, a Monty Python sketch, I've got, you know, there's a, there's a two minute version of this talk, there's a five minute version, 10 minute version, 30 minute version, one hour version, kind of 10 hour trance mix version. And you can choose which one you want. Actually, I can. I'm here to please. So, shorter, longer. I'm feeling shorter. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm going to read a, a few little bits because it, because it, it's faster, not because uh, it's not in my head, because it's just quicker. And um, I've got lots to say in relationship to what. Um, Armin was saying, but I'll... So the book is a book... Um, uh, in many ways, the point is to read the 31 tragedies. There are 31 plays. And they don't take that long. And it's usually the same plays that are produced over and over again. Last time I was in Oslo in, in June, there was a production of Antigone. Antigone is very often produced, Medea is very often produced, Oedipus the King is very often produced, but lots of them are not produced. And um, it, it's an extraordinary range of material. And so in many ways, the, 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 the book that I've written is, is a plea to read them all and not to read them through, not to, not to read them just through the lens that is provided by people like Hegel, Nietzsche and Freud, brilliant as they are but to look at the plays. And in the first version of the, the book, which was savagely edited by my editor, uh, there was a chapter on Ibsen, which might be of local interest, which is being cut. Um, maybe it will appear in some other form. And one thing that's of interest to me is that how this, this form washes up into, into Ibsen. So I'm gonna read you a, a few little bits and then talk, and then stop, and then we can have a we can have a chat. Um, this is the uh, okay. I'll read this. The time is out of joint. The time is out of joint. No, that's not going to work. I'm going to stand. The time is out of joint, and something is rotten in the states we inhabit. We can smell it. Our country is a split. Our houses are divided, divided, and the fragile web of family and friendship withers under the black sun of big tech. Everything that passed as learning seems to have reached boiling point. We simmer and feel the heat, wondering what can be done. The book that will come out in April, Tragedy of the Greeks and Us, tries to confront that situation that I think is the situation that we're in by carefully looking through the lens of Greek tragedy. And tragedy pre presents a world of conflict and troubling emotion, a world where private and public lives collide and collapse, a world of rage, grief, and war. A world where morality is ambiguous and the powerful humiliate and destroy the powerless. A world where justice always seems to be on both sides and sugar-coated words serve as cover for clandestine operations of violence. A world rather like our own. We have to try, in my view, to make the ancients live again for our time. They hold up a mirror to us where we see all the desolation and delusion of our lives, but also the terrifying beauty and intensity of existence. This is not a time for consolation prizes or the fatuous banalities of the self-help industry or pop philosophy. Philosophy, as it's usually understood, is part of the problem and not part of the solution. So this project is 
resolutely anti-philosophical um, in ways that I try to show textually, but there are also arguments. And interestingly, Jan Inger asked me whether I had uh, opinions about Jordan Peterson. And in many ways, this would be the opposite to that. It's like Jordan Peterson, you get advice. In the character, spoken quickly, so you can't interrupt it, based on claims to evidence, which appears to uh, give you a guide as to how to live. This is the opposite of that. And this is what's going on in these plays, and it's much more troubling because it's closer to the truth. And the idea that I'm working with is in order to understand ourselves better, we have to go back to, to theatre, to the stage of our lives. And what tragedy allows us to glimpse in its harsh and unforgiving glare is the burning core of our aliveness. And if we give ourselves the chance to look at that core, to look at tragedy, we might see further and see more clearly. So also this, is a, this, this, this project is an argument for theatre, uh, for that experience that you can have in theatre, and I think have best in theatre. And uh, what happens when you look at something extremely troubling that's going on in a play, when you give yourself over to that. So that's the first, that, that's, that's the two minute version of the project. Uh, I'll read a tiny bit more, and then I think I'll talk about rage and grief and love. Rage and grief and war, not love. Tragedy, this is called feeding the ancients with our own blood. Tragedy shows what's perishable, what's fragile, and what is slow moving about us. In a world defined by relentless speed, and the unending acceleration of information flows that cultivate amnesia and an endless thirst for the short-term future, guaranteed through worship of the new prosthetic gods of technology, tragedy is a way of applying the emergency break. Tragedy slows things down by confronting us with what we do not know about ourselves, an unknown force that unleashes violent effects on us on a daily indeed often minute-by-minute minute basis. Such is the sometimes terrifying presence of the past that we might seek to disavow, but which will have its victory in the end, if only in the form of our mortality. We might think we're through with the past, but the past isn't through with us. Through its sudden reversals of fortune and rageful recognition of the truth of our origins, tragedy permits us to come face-to-face -face with what we do not know about ourselves, but which makes those selves the things that they are. Tragedy provokes what snags in our being, the snares and the booby traps of the past that we blindly trip over in our relentless stumbling forward movement. This is what the ancients called fate, that fate requires our complicity. It requires our participation in order to come down on us. But the fruit of a consideration of tragedy is not a sense of life's hopelessness or moral resignation. It is rather a deepened sense of the self in its dependency on others, of the self's vulnerable exposure to apparently, apparently familiar and apparently familial patterns of kinship. Although it sometimes turns out like Oedipus, you don't know who your parents are. Or if you do know who your parents are, you don't really know who they are. Right? One of the most salient and oddest features about Greek tragedy is its constant negotiation with the other, especially the enemy other, the foreign other. The oldest play that we possess, short play called Persians by Aeschylus from 472 BC, the oldest piece of theatre we have, depicts the defeated enemy, the Persian enemy. And it depicts them not with triumph, but with sympathy, and with an anticipation of the possible humiliation that might face the Greeks should they repeat the hubris of the Persians. And there's a lesson which is addressed 
from the Persians in that play to the Athenians is a lesson that was not heard or followed. And Athens rolled on through a period of imperial hegemony in the 5th century until it was humiliated through a long and corrosive war, the Peloponnesian Wars that lasted for 30 years, in the shadow of which most of the plays that we have were written. And perhaps there's a moral to be drawn for our time and place from that. We know the empire is, the heyday of the empire is over, and we live in a constant state of war. But the first rule of war, if we read these plays, is sympathy with the enemy. The, pl the question that comes out, there's, there's lots of other things I could say about this. And I'll, I'll, I'm skipping and compressing here. The, um, if you go to Aristotle, who would appear to be a good guide to tragedy, the poetics is the, you know, the founding text of what's called aesthetics. It's largely a discussion of tragedy. Um, he defines tragedy as the imitation of action. Imitation of action. So you'd imagine that in the plays there is action. Right? But the peculiar thing about Greek tragedies is there isn't action in the plays. What we have are words. The action takes place either before the play or it takes place off stage. What we have are the consequences of that. The effect of that on stage is very interesting. When I've read these 31 plays over, over the years, the, um, the phrase that I kept uh, finding in play after play was a question. And the question is very simple. How do I act? What do I do? So in play after play, we find the chorus, usually, in a state of disorientation and asking the question, what do I do? How do I act? So if we begin from this Aristotelian idea of tragedy as the imitation of action, it doesn't take us very far. Because tragedy is about uh, a question about action, that we're uncertain about the nature of action. Now, the joy of wandering into the ancient world is, uh, is great. For someone like me, I'm not, I'm not a classicist, but I try as hard as I can. Um, but the thing is that the interesting thing about Greek tragedy is that we don't know uh, a great deal about it. We have 31 plays. We have no online reviews. We have no blogs, no tweets, no opinions, no pieces in the press, no debates. Um, as to what these things mean. We just have these plays. And we have no idea uh, what the spectators were meant to take from these plays. None at all. We have a fragment, which I could quote a bit later on in the 25-minute version of this talk, which would be from, from the, one of the heroes of this, um, this book, who's called Gorgias, a sophist from Sicily originally, who did great business in Athens. We have that, we have a little bit in Aristophanes, the frogs. Um, and then the other reports, we have a tragedy from Plato and Aristotle. And asking Plato for his, for relying on Plato for a, 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 an accurate report of Greek tragedy is like asking the, um, you know, the Christian monks in the monasteries of the north of England for an accurate report of the Norse Vikings. Right? It was, it's a rather partial view. So Plato's opinion can't really be trusted. Aristotle appears more benevolent. He appears more benevolent. But actually, what you get in Aristotle is a kind of domestication of the experience of tragedy. It becomes more benign. And it then becomes part of this tradition of what we think of as aesthetics. So we have no idea how tragedy was seen or what it meant. And um, we don't know, uh, we don't know, for example, there's no empirical evidence that women attended the plays. They might have done, but there's no evidence that shows that they did. 
We know that Athenian men attended the plays. We know that foreigners attended the plays, ambassadors, visitors. And we know that slaves attended the plays, some of them, but not women. Which then raises this, this, this huge question that given that Athens was a deeply, deeply patriarchal culture, and that's often misunderstood in the way in which the ancient world is talked about, um, what's going on in these plays where so many of the key characters are female? Uh, Medea, Hecuba, Cassandra, Antigone. They tend to fall into two categories, wives and virgins. And we could talk about that, but we don't know what that means. Was that some act of subversion of the governing norms of the city? Was this some kind of, was theatre some place of uh, implicit kind of feminist insurrection? Right? Or was it just men dressing up as women and having, dressing up as women and having a nice time? Men love dressing up as women and acting out. We don't know which of those two is right, and the, the best classicists that you can read, there's no, we don't know. Um, so, we don't know we, so that leaves us with this position of agnosticism, which I find rather interesting. So why, what happens when we go back to antiquity, and why is it important? I have a quote, which is from a, a, a German classicist called Williamowitz, who was a uh, major important German classicist, but is sometimes known uh, for the fact that he ruined Nietzsche's academic career. Nietzsche wrote his first book, The Birth of Tragedy, and Williamowitz wrote a terrible review of it. And Nietzsche never recovered, left his job, got addicted to patisserie in the south of France, and uh, the tertiary syphilis got him. He wrote some good stuff before then, but you know. It, but Williamowitz, in 1908, at a lecture in Oxford, at a lecture in Oxford, says the following: "The tradition yields us only ruins. The more closely we test and examine, the more clearly we see how ruinous they are. And out of the ruins, no whole can be built. The tradition is dead. Our task is to revivify life that's passed away." We know that ghosts cannot speak until they have drunk blood. And the spirits which we evoke demand the blood of our hearts. We give it to them gladly. It's a very interesting quote because and Nietzsche paradoxically says something rather similar in, in his work. But it means that if we want to make the ancients speak, then we have to give them some of our blood. We have to give them a blood sacrifice in order for them to revive. And when they are revived, when they come back to life, who are they? They're the ancients, but with our blood in their veins. It's our blood that makes those ghosts come alive again. Which means that what we're looking at, always when we're looking at the ancients, is ourselves in some strange form, which means that the history, of the, the history of the understanding of antiquity is the history of the understanding of different periods which, which have attempted to revive the ancients. I mean, and so my bizarre proposition in this project is to try and offer a little blood sacrifice in order to revive the ancients. Um, why on earth do that? It's um, in order to slow us down, in a way. And so that the, um, I think what the, this sounds a little, let me, let me read this bit. Um, in my view, every generation has to reinvent the classics with a blood sacrifice. And I think it's the responsibility of every, every generation to engage in this reinvention. And this is the very opposite of cultural conservatism. If we don't accept that invitation to um, 
revive the ancients, then we risk becoming even more stupid and stupefied by the present and the endless onrush of the future. And the nice thing about this stupefaction is that it can be avoided by something that's no more difficult than reading. And most of the plays are not that long, which is one reason that I like reading plays. And I see that as the responsibility of each generation to try and reinvent something about antiquity, not for antiquarian interest, right? That's not the issue. But in order to give us a, another sense of ourselves, another image of ourselves, to arrest us momentarily from the irresistible pull of the future. So in a way, a way of putting this polemically would be to say this, that I'm against the future against the preoccupation with the future, against the obsession with the future, and the way in which um, intellectuals get caught up in that obsession with the future and end up on government policy think tanks and the rest, thinking about what the future implications for X, Y, or Z are going to be. What antiquity does is to stop that, is to slow that down and allow, the, allow us to understand the effects of the past on the present. And when we begin to slow down and understand the effects of the past on the present, then the future looks different. But we have to stop. And um, I've got good stuff here, but I'm going to cut that. And that's going to go. That's going to go. Oedipus, it's nice, but it goes on a bit. We don't need that. Do we need that? That could be good. Let's try that. I'll do two more things. Yeah. Um, why does tragedy exist? This is a question that uh, the poet and classicist Anne Carson is one of the heroes of this project. She's a, a genius, in my humble opinion. Anne Carson says, asked the question in her translations of Euripides, why does tragedy exist? Her answer is, because you are full of rage. Why are you full of rage? Because you're full of grief. Right? And this is absolutely right. If we think about Antigone, she rages because she's full of grief for her brother Polynices, who's been refused burial, burial rights by the city, the, leaders, the leader of the city, Creon. Clytemnestra rages at Agamemnon because of the grief that she experiences for her daughter, who's been slaughtered, sacrificed, um, in order to give a favorable wind to the Greek ships going over to engage in the 10-year war that's the Trojan War that completely futile exercise of which we have the traces in Homer's Iliad. But what makes that possible is the slaughter of uh, a young woman who's told the reason why she goes to where the, the boats are gathered, like a kind of Argive version of Stavanger, is she's told that she's going to marry Achilles, the hottest of the hot Greeks, right? She goes, OK, yeah, I'll marry him. But instead, she's slaughtered like a young foal, it's described in Aeschylus, like a young horse. Clytemnestra is pissed off. <laughs> it's the rage that she experiences flows from grief. Uh, those, there's that, there's lots more, lots more rage. But we might add something else to that list in Anne Carson. If tragedy is a rage that follows from grief, then why is one full of grief? Because we're full of war and people have been killed. Tragedy might be described as grief-stricken rage that flows from war. We live in a world whose frame is war and where justice seems to be endlessly divided between claim and counterclaim, right and left, conservative and progressive, believer and non-believer, freedom fighter and terrorist or whatever. Each side believes unswervingly in the rightness of its position and the wrongness or as is usually said, the evil of the enemy. And such a belief legitimates violence. 
a destructive violence that unleashes counter-violence in return. We seem trapped in a cycle of bloody revenge and locked into vicious circles of grief and rage caused by war. Such is what seems to pass for international politics in our world. And this is where I think a reflection on Greek tragedy might at least illuminate our current predicament and tell us something about our present. Because the history of Greek tragedy is a history of war. From the war that, um, with the Persians, um, which is memorialized in the first play that we have, the Battle of Salamis, in this, the defeat of the Persians, which is memorialized in that play, through to the wars that uh, are in the background of nearly every play, and the Peloponnesian Wars, the, the, uh, the wars that Athens led with Sparta for 30 odd years. And um, there's also other stuff that comes out of that, which is very interesting and contemporary, and we could think about it. Because um, why is Athens at war? It's at war because the people want to go to war. Right? Uh, the people vote for it. Democracy is warlike, and democracy makes fundamental errors, which is why when Plato comes on the scene a couple of generations later, the object of his rage, it's not stated as rage, but the object of uh, Socrates' hostility is democracy. Right? Democracy which leads always to tyranny, right? and a tyranny which is bound up with, with war, what we would call at this point the phenomenon of populism. And um, so tragedy is rage, grief in a situation of war. The big difference between Greek tragedy and theatre now is that Greek tragedy um, was a tragedy that was about combat veterans, but it was also performed by combat veterans. Actors were not flimsy thespians who had majored in performance studies with an abstract interest in social engagement, but soldiers who had seen combat. Right? The only thing that Aeschylus had on his tombstone was that he fought in the Battle of Marathon. The play is, who gives a shit? But he'd fought in the Battle of Marathon. He was a soldier. So tragedy was played before an audience that had either directly participated in war or were indirectly implicated in war. All were traumatized by war. War was the life of the city and its pride, as Pericles argues, but also its undoing. But tragedy, this is what's so interesting about it, is a war story without a John Wayne figure. It's a war story without a swaggering individualist who's the sole source of good in a world gone bad. In Greek tragedy, the hero is not the solution to the problem, but the problem itself. The hero is the source of the plague that's killing the city. This is, what's, this is the backstory to Oedipus the king, which is why it's called Oedipus Tyrannos in Greek, Oedipus the tyrant. The king is a tyrant who's polluting the city, and any resolution to the drama is the expulsion and exile of the tyrant. So what you find in ancient tragedy is a, not the idealized violence, empty empathy, and hollow sentimentality of many contemporary war fictions, particularly in the United States. If tragedy is a drama performed by war veterans before an audience of veterans, then it pictures a world without heroes and without tyrannical leaders. And um, there's a lot more to say about that. It's um, And if you want, so if we want to think about the context of war, which is one way of describing the situation that we're in, or the phenomenon of uh, rage, which is one way of describing the situation that we're in, right? one way of thinking about where we are, 
wherever we are, where we are now, as Bowie would say, is the uh, um, amplification of rage. Right? And the amplification of rage, which is sometimes based in grief, sometimes based in a kind of pseudo-rage. Tragedy gives us an extraordinary vocabulary for thinking that through. I'm going to pass over all that and say a word about Aeschylus's Oresteia. Hmm. Okay, so the only extant trilogy we have, it might have been the only extant three-part play, is the Oresteia. And um, the Oresteia is fascinating. There are three plays. <laughs> The first play, Clytemnestra, the wife of Agamemnon, kills Agamemnon because Agamemnon has killed their daughter, Iphigenia, in order to go to war in Troy. So Clytemnestra waits 10 years. She waits 10 years, quietly raging, fuming. She sets up a beacon relay system. She's described in the first lines of the Agamemnon a beacon relay system of, of fires which connect Argos, Greece, to Troy. An early warning kind of media relay system. And she gets word that he's, the war is over, Hubby is coming home, and he comes back, and he comes back not just alone, he's got his booty with him in all senses of that word, Cassandra. Right? Cassandra, who's in many ways the most interesting figure in in um, the plays, the Trojan priestess who was herself um, uh, raped by the god Apollo. And that rape had a peculiar twist, namely that uh, initially, so it is said, uh, Cassandra consented to sexual congress with the god. I'm not sure what sort of choice you got, you know. Apollo said, well, you up for it or not? And at a certain point, she withdrew. She shrank back. And Apollo gave her the gift of prophecy, the, the ability to foretell the future, but with the twist that her prophecy would never be believed. So she's in the play, and it's absolutely fascinating because she's a non-Greek in a Greek play, and there are all these non-Greeks in the Greek play. And Cassandra's particularly interesting because... Uh, they're not sure, the chorus aren't sure whether she understands what's being said. They describe her as like a, a bird that's been caught, crazy, mad bird, and she begins by screaming. Her first words are, ototototoi totoi pa, which is usually translated into English as kind of, ah. <laughs> but in Greek, the, the, the Greek kind of screams are interesting. They're, they're, they're punctual, ototototoi pa, 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 it's like that. So that's her scream. And then, it, then, it, then it, she tells her story of her rape by the god. And then she tells the story of what happened in the past and what will happen. And she can foresee her own death. Uh, and she tells that story to everyone, to the chorus. And they go, what's this girl saying? No idea. Uh, Clytemnestra comes out, takes in Agamemnon. And then she says, you know, bring Cassandra in too. They're both slaughtered in the, uh, in the house of Atreus, the slaughterhouse, as it's described. And then the bodies, we don't see the murder, but the bodies are brought out on a, a device that the, the Greeks called an echoclaimer, a kind of trolley. We're not quite sure what it was, like a, like a shopping trolley or something like that. <laughs> and the bodies are displayed in a kind of tableau, Agamemnon, Cassandra, and then um, Clytemnestra says, behold a masterpiece of justice. Right? So there's one claim to justice. The, play, the theme of the play is justice. Second play, um, some, some time later, uh, Orestes, who's, been, who's the son 
uh, who's um, been exiled for a period of time, finds himself back, back home trying to visit his father's grave. Bumps into this young woman. Uh, they discover their brother and sister. It's the first kind of comic recognition scene we have in, in drama, the sort of thing that you know, Shakespeare used to play with much later on. Oh, is it you? Is it you? Or you look like somebody else? Whatever. And then um, they work out that they've got to kill their mother. And that, that's the action of the second play. Orestes kills um, Clytemnestra. And she, um, I mean, she really turns it on because she knows she's going to, you know, she knows what's going to happen. She says she, she exposes her breasts and she said, how can you murder? You, 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 you sucked from these, these teats. They gave you life. How can you kill me? And at that point, Orestes hesitates for a second. He says, what shall I do? And um, his, his mate, Pylades, is with him. says, okay, the god Apollo ordained it. He says, okay. And he drags her inside, kills her. And uh, that's just too. Um, that's just because that's ordained by the god Apollo. So the point of those first two plays of the Oresteia is we have two claims to justice. And those two claims to justice are shown to be in conflict. In many ways, what justice is in ancient tragedy is conflict. So here's a key difference with um, the way philosophers or people uh, will tend to talk about concepts, but a concept like justice. That if we want to think about a concept like justice, then we need an account of it a theory of it. We could write a book called A Theory of Justice, the most important work of political philosophy of the last 70 years by John Rawls. The point of, in Aeschylus is that there's no theory of justice. Justice is conflict. It's a conflict between opposed claims which find themselves battering into each other. The third play, the Eumenides, the kindly ones, um, those two claims are adjudicated in a court the action shifts from, firstly, to the oracle at Delphi. A lot of stuff there going on, very interesting. And then we go to Athens, to the Areopagus, the, 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 the court where, um, where murder trials used to be conducted in antiquity. And the, the jury are going to decide whether Orestes is guilty of matricide or not. And um, he doesn't deny it. Um, but the, <clears throat> the judge, the presiding judge, is Athena. And uh, Athena seems, you know, it's her city, Athens, Athena, so why not? And she seems fair, and, she, and there, also the other thing I've left out is that when Orestes, at the end of the second play, Orestes is pursued after he's killed his mother, by these, uh, these creatures called the Furies, that only, in early on, only he can see that when, he, um, when the consequences of his action begin to dawn on him, these Furies, these dark, ghastly Gorgons appear and begin to pursue him and hunt him down. And they pursue him to Athens, and they want justice, which is justice of the earth, uh, the old law, as they put it, against Orestes, the new law, Apollo, and they've got to fight this out in the court. So what often happens in, in tragedies is that the, the law court becomes the mechanism for the thinking through of the question of justice, which also means, or for, for questions, which also raises the question of the proximity between theatre and law, right? And the fact that law is also a kind of a theatre. Anyway, Orestes... Um, gets off, um, is acquitted, because uh, the, the jury, the votes are dis, uh, equally divided. But Athena says, I will give my vote to Orestes. Why? Because although I may look like a woman, and you may think I'm a woman, I'm actually not a woman. I was born fully formed from the head of Zeus. And I honor, she says, the male principle in all things. Um, so, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm effectively a man. I didn't pass through any womb, right? Um, so she says Orestes goes free, and then she persuades the, um, the Furies to come over to be the protectresses of the city, the Eumenides, the kindly ones, 
and then um, the play the play ends. <clears throat> what is going on in in a play like the Oresteia? Well, we don't really know. But what seems to be going on is that the what the city of Athens is doing in that case is telling the history, the story and the history of violence from which it emerged, the slaughterhouse from which the city emerged. And uh, in order for that city to be an actual city, it's got to be based on conflict, on a conflictual understanding of justice, which is, uh, and the best that we can hope for in, in the tragedies is not that uh, violence and war will, s will ever come to an end. There will be peace, but they could be suspended for a period of time. And then the city can go back to war. Okay, that's the... Oh, the other thing I want to argue for, just really quickly, but we could go into that, would be polytheism. Um, in my humble opinion, it's just me. You can ignore me. It doesn't matter. Um, just, a, you know, it's a Wednesday evening. and um, But um, I think the disaster of the, um, the world is monotheism. The idea that there's one God who's a universal God and then has um, exclusive access over who is saved or not saved, who is good or not good, whether that's in, in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, or in the monotheism of, uh, say, human rights, democracy, liberalism discourse. Um, what you find in, in, um, in Greek tragedy is a polytheistic world, and a polytheistic world where these gods are described uh, as constantly in conflict, where gods have this rich, thick context, but where they batter against each other, and where there's no uh, attempt to... You believe that your gods are the best gods because of the gods of your city, but there's no... Um, attempt to impose your gods on other people's gods, on other people, so that the Spartans have their gods, they're the gods of the Spartans, they're entitled to them. Our gods as Athenians are better gods, but they can have their gods. And I think it would just be a better place if we went back to polytheism. <laughs> That's just my thought for a Wednesday evening. And let me finish uh, that. Is, is tragedy uh, a... Um, Available to us, available to us now, and um, I mean, there's there's a debate which I won't go into, which is uh, one side of the debate is that tragedy is over, theatre is over, it's dead. Um, someone like George Steiner, that old windbag, or 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 uh, it's not. Someone like Raymond Williams, who's another kind of uh, hero of this book, Raymond Williams' book, Modern Tragedy, I'm very keen on on Williams. And um, the question is, you know, is, is tragedy um, available to us? Do we, do we live it? And I think we do, uh, which means that it's a, the way I understand tragedy is it's a mode of experience. It's a mode of experience that exists outside theater, in film, TV, politics, uh, and most powerfully in our domestic lives our familial relationships, our kinship structures. And furthermore, it's a dialectical mode of experience. S specifically, it's a mode of reversal, inversion, and negation. So what you find in, in, um, in tragedy is you see, um, uh, you, you see positions being presented and destroyed. Uh, you see things being negated, pulled away, and you're forced to experience that. And that gives you, a, I think, a richer understanding of the world than the idea that we can look through some um, philosophical lens and uh, offer the 12 rules to life, or whatever it might be. And um, so I think the, the, we, deserve, uh, we deserve better than that. And I think that's, um, 
what theatre tragedy can offer. And you know, in many ways, to um, to come back to the, the the sort of core idea and finish, it's the. Um, I mean, I like theatre. I mean, um, but what I like about theatre is the. Um, you know, the idea of you, you go into a, a space uh, in the dark, say, um, and um, you watch something. You watch someone's existence being torn to pieces. Well, torn to pieces. You're watching, say, Oedipus the King. And at that point, when you're watching, when you give yourself to that experience, um, your your moral views, your opinions, your thoughts are suspended. You're not in some trance-like, you know, drunk state the way Nietzsche kind of describes it. You are coldly disinterestedly looking at something. You're looking at someone fall to pieces, say with you know, Hedda Gabler, the same, or, or, or ghosts, the same kind of structure is in play. And if we give ourselves to that, then we can, I think, slow down and uh, allow ourselves uh, a complexity and depth of experience that we deny ourselves in our constant thirst to know what's what, find a Wikipedia entry, find some smart thing to say, work out some tagline that you can tell to your boss or whatever it might be. And um, that's, it's that lesson that I think um, tragedy can teach us. And so what philosophy does, to cut an awfully long story short, is to tidy that up, to tidy that up. And in particular, the, um, the problem that philosophy in Plato has with uh, Greek tragedy is turns on the question of emotion, of, of, uh, of, of affect. And in particular, the, the emotion of, of grief of lamentation, because it um, it effeminizes people, it effeminizes men, and divides human beings from themselves. It's kind of Socrates' argument, and that's why we cannot have it in a just city. So, in a just city governed by just laws and governed by philosophers, which is the thing that Plato imagines in the Republic there can be no place for theatre. Um, that's one way of organising things. That's, um, that's a kind of philosophical authoritarianism, which can have different kinds of governmental implications, different ways of thinking about that. Theatre is, um, is more complex. It's more democratic, but where the, with the big caveat, the big question that democracy is something can al that can also produce monsters, that can produce awful outcomes. You can't legislate that grief and lamentation out of existence, um, but if you organize things democratically, there's always that threat that out of democracy will end up in, in tyranny um, and, and war. So tragedy doesn't give you Answers, it gives you questions in a more uh, painful and sustained way. And I think that's one thing we need right now. And on that bombshell, I'll shut up. Thank you for listening. Well, time is a tyrant in any event. Yeah. Um, my third comment will be that maybe we need a short break. Five minutes. But that was my third comment. I have <laughs> two others. <laughs> uh, and my first comment will be, how dare you speak of other gods in the city of Stavanger? <laughs> <coughs> You're courageous. And, and my second point will be, uh, uh, and it has to be said before the break, that a major part in many Greek tragedies is played by the herald or the messenger. Yes. Yeah. For instance, in Medea by Euripides, 
you never, we never as a public witness uh, Medea's actual killing of her and Jason's common children. And in other places, we don't actually witness the atrocities. We don't actually uh, uh, witness the most tragic events going on in the tragedy. But we are told them uh, by a messenger appearing on stage and giving us an idea of all the things that has happened. Mm -hmm. That is the way it is conveyed. Mm -hmm. And the more you spoke, the more you entered this uh, messenger, uh, this messenger role, <laughs> and and uh, and and the more the temperature uh, was uh, rising in your speech, <laughs> the more you became an actor on a stage. Um, and maybe that will uh, serve to also uh, uh, underline your your high uh, high estimation of this art form, in contrast to uh, the form of mere philosophy. <laughs> um, but with those two or three comments, the third one was a short break. Uh, Jan Inge, som er husets herre her, og som har fått alt dette i stand, uh, kan godt, før vi tar pausen, få en uh, applaus. Han også, det er han som har fått i stand alt dette her. Uh, og husherren sier at pausen må være kort, fordi at uh, opprinnelig mente at de skulle være ferdige halv Åtte, det spørs vel kanskje, men vi, sk vi har god tid, ja. Så ta en kort pause, kom inn igjen, og så fordøyer vi dette litt i lag etterpå. Thank you.
Okay. Yeah. We start again, or go on. We're going to make this uh, short and sweet, because... Um, <laughs> I think the moral lesson to be drawn from all this, even before we start the discussion, is something like, go home and read the Greek tragedies. Um, as Norwegians, we have, uh, maybe we have two uh, disadvantages in comparison with uh, Mr. Critchley, disregarding the fact that he now, for some time, uh, has been deeply immersed in this subject, as clearly appeared from his uh, speech. Well, we have the disadvantage that English is not our native tongue, mm -hmm. but I would like the audience uh, to overcome uh, their fear of English and just speak Norv English, which is a well-established uh, idiom, uh, in order to ask uh, questions. I have a million points here, but I want to, to let the word uh, uh, go around uh, uh, first. The second disadvantage we maybe have as Norwegians in comparison with a British person is I believe that the ancient literature in general, and the Greek tragedies uh, more in particular, still uh, forms a, a, a larger part of a British, uh, I don't know, school and university education than it does in Norway. Uh, we don't really, uh, I, I, if, if I hadn't, if I hadn't uh, myself, uh, you know, found my way to this kind of literature, I would not know anything about it. Mm. Uh, we, we were taught very little about it in, 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 in school. There's not a strong tradition for reading these texts uh, uh, in, in the Norwegian educational system. Uh, I think uh, uh, if what you about, start... What about plays in general? I mean, obviously Ibsen, mm? Ibsen would be the great example. What about drama in, in general? Would yes, of course. Uh, a hundred years ago, there was still a tradition in Norwegian schools that one should learn about the classical heritage, the biblical heritage and also the classical heritage. So school children a uh, hundred years ago, they had to learn uh, uh, by rote learning about mm -hmm. the Persian Wars, the Peloponnesian Wars, the name of the Gre uh, great Greek tragedians, etc. But at the same time, uh, there was a strong national heritage to be mm -hmm. Uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, cultivated with Ibsen and Björnson and Vinya yeah, and uh, the Vikings and uh, the, mm -hmm. the Vikings are our Greeks mm -hmm. and the, Nor the Norse uh, period is our antiquity mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, the Norse antiquity had a tendency to, you know, outflank uh, the ancient antiquity in, in, our, in our Norwegian uh, educational heritage. Mm -hmm. So... A lot of the things you say um, uh, communicate immediately, but I also can hear uh, that you, there's a lot of things between the lines uh, all the time when you speak uh, that one would have to, you know, uh, immerse oneself in this literature in order to fully grasp. Um, uh, because I was so nervous when we started, uh, I, I characterized your book as a bunch of papers beca because that was what it looks, looked like. Uh, it has not yet <laughs> been, been, been printed. Uh, well, it is a bunch of papers, but it's also... Uh, I'm in the midst of reading it. And uh, you can read it from one end to the other, but you can also read it here and there, and all, you can just look up into it because it's a five- or six-part structure with main themes. But uh, this structure organizes a myriad, almost, uh, a great number of uh, uh, brief essays mm -hmm. discussing all aspects uh, of, of Greek tragedy and discussing Aristotle and discussing Nietzsche and Hegel and all, all kinds of things. So it's a, a virtual essayistic encyclopedia 
uh, on the topic of, of uh, Greek uh, tragedy and its, uh, and its uh, relevance. So we are very much looking forward to this uh, book coming out in a more practical uh, format than this. <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe some of you have electronic uh, equipment to handle this kind of thing. I don't. I think exactly the same things are going on. I mean, not exactly, that, that, but very, very similar things are going on in Ibsen that are going on in Greek tragedy. Mm. I mean, what Ibsen knew, Ibsen pretended he was a lot less well-read than he was, right? Um, but what Ibsen read of uh, the Greeks, yeah. I don't know. But it's, the influence is obvious. But if you think about plays, I mean, you take any of the great um, plays like Hedda or uh, Ghosts or, um, was it Bugmaster Solness and... Um, uh, or when we did awaken the last play, they're all. Um, what we see is somebody falling apart, or somebody being torn apart, it is through, often through the past and the effects of the past on the present. And um, think about you know ghosts most obviously, the you know where the where fate, the the ancient Greek idea of fate becomes venereal disease. Um, and the um, and incest, the incestuous theme is played out obviously in the relationship between the the son and the the serving. I was Miss, yeah, what's her name? Mrs. Alving. You got the, yeah. And then in, in uh, Bugmaster Solnas, it's, it's, it's the same kind of you know, what what happened between Bugmaster Solnas and Hilda Vengo. Did something happen? It's a, that's a very contemporary issue, right? In a sense, there's a kind of we have an allegation of sexual assault or an insinuation of sexual assault, of which the uh, person that made the assault has no memory, and this young woman reappears and destroys the mm. the master builder. And so it's, it's that the way we did the past. Um, you know, we may think we're through with the past, but the past isn't through with us. I mean, that that idea, I think, is um, it's uh, it's not so different in in, in Ibsen to my to my mind. Um, mm. The same structures are in play, which then leads you to ask the question: Well, what's the difference? And then um, we, we like we we like the idea of there being you know historical periods. We love the idea of there being antiquity over there and mm. then there was something else and then there was the Renaissance, there was the early modern, then there was the 19th century that we can teach, we teach literature and organize history in this way. But if you look at drama, you look at, you get, you take Ibsen, you take Shakespeare, you take Euripides, you take Seneca, how different are they really? How, how different are they? I don't know. The human predicament seems to be remarkably similar in uh, across those across those plays, and that's um, so. How much how much have things changed? Mm. Bad shit happens. Feelings don't change. Bad shit happens, and you think you're through with it, and it's over, and. <laughs> It gets you. You're, you, you already are, you're, you're already answering all my questions before, I know, I, I know, I know. before I get to asking them. But are there any questions for, from the from the audience? Yeah, please. Sorry, I'm going on. You told us uh, we we couldn't know how the the audience uh, yes. re reaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in, in place like yeah that. so if you if if you consider that and the catharsis notion mm -hmm. of Aristotle mm -hmm. and uh, what's the meaning of tragedies and what's um, <coughs> why do we uh, go to the theaters today and mm -hmm. why did they go to the theater yeah um, will we get 
um, will we become better persons? Will uh, uh, no. will the best survive and mm. and win in the end? It's a very good question. Um, because the paradox is that if we, if it requires some of our blood to make these, um, the ancients live, then the ancients that um, are revived are like us, uh, always. So we construct an image of antiquity in our image. So we see, when we see the Greeks, we see our Greeks. So um, there's no way past that. So. Um, we see the Greeks in terms of, um, say, around questions of, um, say, gender, um, which appears to be in every play, uh, because that's the issue of the last generations, uh, and it continues to be the question. Um, was that the way the Greeks saw it? We have no idea. And the, um, what do we come away with? I mean, I was, I came from Barcelona this morning, which is another story. It all went very well. Lovely, lovely trip. Um, but I was doing this gig last night in Barcelona, and um, in the place I was doing the gig, they had this exhibition on Stanley Kubrick. Really wonderful exhibition on Kubrick. I've never seen anything, a, a full art show just on Kubrick's films. And, uh, you know, I'm sure people here love the cinema of Stanley Kubrick. You know, um, what does Kubrick teach us? Does watching Kubrick make us a better person? Well, sure. yeah, but in what way? I mean, we are, we, you know, we are, we're, we're, and what catharsis is there? Or if you think, so I think about this in relation to cinema, you know, I think about, I think the catharsis, the, the idea of catharsis, um, in the term is introduced in Aristotle. We don't know what it means. Um, it doesn't mean moral education. It doesn't mean it, there are there are a possible range of meanings. The most common meaning for catharsis in Aristotle is uh, is female menstruation. <laughs> most most times he uses catharsis is in relationship to um, to, to menstruation uh, in women. So uh, catharsis would be a period. He sometimes talks about it in relationship to, ex to going to the toilet, to having a, having a shit or having a. Seriously, that's that's how catharsis is used in the biological works, mm -hmm. and it pops up in the poetics. It might have a ritual reference. It might be a purification, but we're not sure. So catharsis could just be, you go to the theatre, you feel pity and terror, and then that's washed away, and then you go back. And I think, for me, that's the, that's the kind of the, the, the extraordinary thing about human beings, if I may put it that way, rather pretentiously, that you can go and watch like a Kubrick film, like what, Clockwork Orange, uh, or whatever it might be, but let's say Clockwork Orange. And um, you can watch that. And it's still a very disturbing film to watch. And Kubrick was obviously disturbed by the effects that it had on his audience at the time. And um, you watch it. You leave the cinema and um, you go for a drink, you have a chat, sometime later you go to bed, you sleep fine. Um, you get up the next morning, maybe you talk about it to someone, maybe you don't. Um, what catharsis was there? I think, I think so the plays, the, what's more puzzling about the plays is it's more like that. that you, watch, um, you watch a play where someone is torn to pieces uh, destroyed, or we see these contradictions appear. And, um, and the other side, the really interesting side to this um, is that we like it. We, this is there in Aristotle, we experience pleasure, hedoné, right? Um, so we take great pleasure in watching the master builder being torn to pieces. Um, Hedda Gabler shooting herself with her father's gun. What is that pleasure that we take in pain? And, um, and that, I think that that's also raises really interesting questions about that we have to be honest with ourselves about what we're doing when we're... Because what, yeah, what are human beings? 
human beings, for as long as human beings have been human beings, the oldest traces of human society, you know, in the caves in the coasts of South Africa and places all over the world, uh, the, you know, the caves in you know, Spain and France, there seems to be symbolization. We seem to, human beings, when they gather into groups, seem to construct, they seem to want to construct something, to make art of some kind. And um, that seems to be important. And um, what's in, what, is, what is that about? What are we doing in doing that? It serves no obvious function. It doesn't necessarily make people better. It seems to be just, this is what human beings do. They need um, myth, story, things that are indirect, which enable something else to happen, some other realities to impinge. We have another question. Yeah, sorry. I'm talking, I'm too, being too loquacious. Actually, hello. Hello. Um, it isn't another question. Okay. Uh, I just, uh, because I was going to ask you commenting on uh, catharsis, which you have just done. But okay. I want to use the opportunity to thank you for a very stimulating oh, thank and you very interesting much. talk, and especially the last thing you said, said also about you know the function of tragedy and the idea that the feelings, the emotions might make the men in war more feminine. Yes. And then your last comment yeah. on <laughs> catharsis being a menstrual blood. So yeah. How more, f how feminine can you get? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Plato's worry with tragedy is that it turns men into women. Theatre turns men into women. It effeminizes, um, and it effeminizes through emotions. And you find that exactly the same argument. I mean, two thousand years later, uh, Rousseau, you know, lovely old reactionary Rousseau, a complex genius. But um, when Voltaire has got this. He hears that Voltaire has a plan for building a theatre in Geneva, right, his hometown. He writes this letter, the letter to D'Alembert against theatre. And his argument against, against theatre is that if you allow theatre into Geneva, it will effeminize the citizens. It will turn the men into women and the women into even worse women. So the conclusion has to be that if you, if you don't have theatre, you can turn men into proper men. And you, and you can also educate women into being men too. Because the strange thing about <laughs> Plato's Republic is there's an argument for gender equality. He, he thinks that education should be extended to women as well as men. But the kind of women that would be produced by that would be effectively the same as men, with their emotions controlled and all of that nasty, messy stuff cleaned up. And um, what goes on in these plays is um, is is you know in, in play after play we see women very often foreign women Medea um, um, Phaedra uh, who's half foreign um, we see Cassandra uh, Hecuba we see women acting wildly. Uh, and complaining about a situation usually related to a, a, a death which is believed to be unjust and bringing the whole house down, bringing the whole structure collapsing down. And um, we don't know what that means. Again, is that, is this, is theatre then the subversion of the political order? Uh, or is it just men dressing up as women? And you can say the same thing about Shakespeare, right? Is Shakespearean theatre some extraordinary subversion of gender norms in, in Elizabethan England? And you could read much of it that way. Or is it just a kind of a drag? <laughs> it's a great kind of drag performance. Uh, and we, we don't know which it is. Um, Shakespeare, in the words of Harold Bloom, will outflank any philosopher. Uh, Absolutely. I yeah. completely agree. But uh, I have some questions, but are there more questions? Because I don't want to ask them if you ask them. Talk about Shakespeare, that would be good. 
I was, I mean, working, through, I was working through the history plays recently, mm. the, um, the, 50, the Richard II to Richard III, that whole sequence. But now you are talked about, uh, okay, Eric Chevron. Uh, thank you for a very stimulating uh, talk. Uh, uh, I'd just like to ask, uh, uh, you got as far as Kubrick uh, uh, 20 years back, uh, uh, but I wonder, uh, you, you said you're going to make a blood sacrifice to put something new into uh, tragedy. Uh, aren't we living in Plato's nightmare? Yep. Uh, uh, the Absolutely. stage is there at the camera. Yeah. Uh, uh, so... Uh, where do you get your optimism about? Uh, oh, uh, this isn't optimistic at all, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So what new blood are you going to put in uh, uh, to get it, uh, go up against uh, uh, big tech? Was that what you said? Yeah. Uh, I'm a teacher. I see big tech uh, grabbing young people all yeah. around. Yeah. And I see no, uh, I see no resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'd be glad to hear yeah, I mean, your I, tactics. Me, me too. I mean, me too. Um, um, I am. Um, a book I was fond of last year was that book, um, "World Without Mind" by Franklin, Franklin Foer, the existential threat of big tech, which is on the four big tech companies and how they have how they became these huge, t and how they're destroying everything, and how the, uh, his argument there is that reading, the, the reading of physical books is a, a quiet act of resistance against that. That's very nice, but I think too optimistic. We've, we've opted for the cave. We've opted, for, we've opted to live in a, um, we've, We've chosen to, yeah, to, 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 to conspire with a, uh, the, most ex the most aggressive kind of simulation that we can't even, the consequences of which we can't even really imagine. Right? It's, um, and we know that something has changed, and it's changed really quite recently. I think we're talking about really 2000. I mean, 2008 is often, a, is, is, is usually cited as a key year, but really 11, 12, 13, it's that recent. And we know that something's changed. We know that human behavior has changed. We know it's having a, a huge effect on family life and on friendships and on sexual life and on everything else. Uh, but we don't quite know how to describe that yet. And... Um, so it's it's kind of, it's gone too fast, and then the worry is that the technology is stripping the guts out of um, what we think of as what counts as as being human. I mean, one one way of responding to that, of saying this is this is too much, would be kind of generational. Would be to say, well, yeah, um, old people are old people are fucked up by Facebook because they don't know how to use it, right? And, um, and that's why they post too much stuff and they're always taking photographs of their meals and they feel, and then they feel threatened by it. But if you look at, and there's, there's an argument that I think what's, what's interesting is the way in which um, there's a background foreground issue that I think that with, when I've, I'm doing some work on technology at the moment with a, with a Danish friend of mine, actually. We're, we're, we're thinking about this, trying to think about it, and with some, you know, actually observational, you know, ethnographic data. And um, what's interesting is that people are, people, very rather young people who are very sophisticated technologically, um, the technology is very much a background practice. Right? It's not something that's even noticed anymore. Right? It's not... They they have no interest in technology as such. They're not. They don't think it. They don't think of it as anything odd. It's just. It's a kind of part of a a fluid background practice. That's one of the practices that make up the way life is organised. Um, so there's a sense in which, for people that are that have grown up with this, they have a different relationship to it. But it's it's restructuring. Um, 
human relationships in fairly significant ways. I mean, you know, and then you've got to look at the... I read a piece yesterday in, the, in, a, in a business magazine that I was sent, you know, the, on the amount of screen time that um, uh, key figures in Silicon Valley allowed their children, which is very, very, li very little screen time because they realise how bad this is. So, um, so what do we do? Do we legislate? I don't know. Um, are we overdoing it? Are we overstating the significance of this? Is this something that we'll learn to manage and deal with in the next 10 years, possibly? I don't know. But it's, 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 it's led to a dramatic shift, I think, in, and we, we find it hard to describe. And also it's linked to, you know, questions of rage, the way in which, I mean, what's the, the really interesting question, and I don't have the answer to this, is that in um, a number of different contexts, uh, social and political contexts, the United States, uh, Brazil, Sweden, um, France, Britain, um, here possibly, I don't know, but the, uh, there's been this... Uh, emptying of the centre of politics and a drift towards uh, a kind of right-wing populism, as it's called, on the one hand, and a kind of a leftist version of that on the other, right? So we have, we have uh, the emergence of two kind of claims to purity, uh, a rightist and a leftist claim. And both of these um, phenomena are being enabled by technology in different ways, right? And, um, and that's led to the situation where the, the center is missing or is, is shifted in, in, in political life. And technology is being used as a kind of amplification device for um, uh, reaffirming people in their, in their prejudices. In, and, and, that, and that's a way of feeding outrage very often, producing kind of kinship groups, friendship groups, and feeding outrage. So the relationship between, um, between big tech and politics, I think, is, um, is kind of obvious, but we've, we're not really in a position yet to really think that through, what, really what's gone on there, because it's been very fast. But in order not to end on a too pessimistic note, we should observe that we are not doing this meeting by Skype. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We are actually here. Yeah. Yeah. We are <laughs> talking people. Yeah. And we see each other's faces and we have wine. Yeah. So uh, I agree. Uh, the time, uh, the times are moving fast, but it, we are also moving slow. So I'm not so pessimistic. I see pencils and paper and things, and this is my phone. <laughs> That's your phone. Is that a Nokia? It's a Nokia, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I see this... Is that the with last Nokia in existence in the world? Is no, it? Uh, <laughs> I see that with, 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 with younger people, too. They, 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 they start to take notes in writing instead yes. of the computers they had 10 years ago. Yeah. So I also think the more this technology is domesticized among younger people, they will... Uh, they will resist it in their own way. I think you're right about that. That's that yeah, my yeah, hope. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful about that too. How, uh, how specific uh, is your, uh, uh, I will not say defense of Greek tragedy, but your uh, exhortation to read Greek tragedy in comparison with what one could call the uh, art or canonical literature uh, in general because one could imagine one could one, one could imagine um, a call for uh, more reading of high literature or uh, yeah. uh, or art in general mm -hmm. but you after all focus uh, your book is not on homer it's not on shakespeare this no. time you no. have written on hamlet and things but but uh, there is something about Greek tragedy in particular which you think resonates uh, with, uh, with uh, strongly or 
with, with a particular, it has a particular kind of relevance now. Yeah. I think there are arguments in, also in the speech you gave here for, for, for uh, a relevance of Greek tragedy which is more particular than the, it being like high literature or something like that. In oh, general. sure, sure, mm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think there's, there's something about the, um, you know, the, the, realism, the realism or the pessimism um, of, uh, of Greek tragedy, which is, which is distinctive. And the fact that there's a, a very limited um, fund of stories which were being worked with, which is also a possible link to Norse, uh, Norse traditions, you know, we have a, a range of stories which are, in the Greek sense, they're the myths, and then they are they become drama. Why? So the Greekness is um, is distinctive. On the other hand, mm -hmm. on the other hand, um, this is an argument for theatre, really, and I think that once what what particularly interests me in, in, uh, in theatre is the fact there's no narrator. There's nobody telling you mm. what they feel or what they think uh, or what, what this means or offering you reflect. There's no, nothing wrong with that. But what com particularly compels me about, about drama uh, is that we are, we're left in a situation of moral ambiguity. Um, we don't know what to think. We're not told what to think. Ibsen doesn't tell us what to think. Hmm. Um, we are presented with a complex situation and we're being asked to look at it. Look at it really closely hmm. and decide for yourself what you think about this. So I think there's something... Uh, I'd make the same, same arguments about Shakespeare, but what makes Shakespeare so extraordinary, I mean... You know, regardless of you know how much of a genius he was, because he was, but is that you you're given no clue what to make of this mm. uh, in any of the any of the the great plays or the play sequences? What does this mean? Um, you and this is where I think this is what's so important because we now well not just now but maybe increasingly now we want. Some kind of reassurance. We want some to be told. This is what this. This is what this means. Do this. You know, here are the. Here are the rules of life, or whatever. This is what you should do. And theatre refuses to do that. It exposes you to contradictions, and you're presented with those contradictions, and you figure it out how you respond to that. And uh, I think it's true of, of, you know, of Brecht. It's true of all the great. Uh, Dramatists and um, and uh, there's an interesting linguistic uh, uh, connection. Uh, maybe you mentioned it here. You elaborate more on it in your in your book between the word theater, mm -hmm. which derives from a word which means to to look at yeah. skue. Mm -hmm. So the old Norwegian word for a theater is skue plus. Uh -huh. It means uh, a place for looking at things is mm -hmm. the name of the the, the, the theatron. Mm -hmm. Now we use the word theater, but it's become more, it's more a foreign word. But it uh -huh. means looking place. Uh -huh. uh, and the co connection is between the word uh, theater and the word theory. Yeah, because we live in an age of information uh, overload, uh, etc. But we also live in an age, and at least in the academic world, in an age of uh, theory overload. Absolutely. There are so many theories, not least in philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is being theorized. So, so I, I, I think your your the project, your book here, is also a call for, you know, an alternative to the theoretical model for understanding yes. everything. Yeah. So, a return to the the original way of looking at things which was done in the ancient days between, uh, uh, in, in the form of theater, but also narratives. Yeah. You're also an onlooker to Homer mm -hmm. when you listen to Homer. Yeah. Nobody tells you really how to you know, understand it theoretically. I was, uh, uh, yes, ab ab absolutely. That's absolutely it. It's um, the, there's a, um, this is an, an argument for experience. And um, 
an experience as being something where you're... Um, in order to experience, you have to shut down your opinions and shut down your views and shut down, at least for the period of time you're in a theatre. Right? And the problem I think we have is that we're all stuck in what we think mm. and what we think about what we think. We're kind of trapped in our heads. It's, it's, it's nightmarish. And uh, the, the pleasure of the pleasure of aesthetic experience is that for a period of time we can we can switch that we can suspend that and look at something, mm. and it's horrible. It can be horrible what's happening, but we we like it, and we're not being judged at that moment. <laughs> and there's something about that which is very very important, I think. And so it's, it's, this is really an argument for experience and and. Um, and giving us trying trying to give yourself over to experience, which is really really hard. I think the hardest thing to do, and I'm really bad at this, uh, because I'm too anxious of a disposition, is observation. Actually, to observe, to look. Um, we don't do that. We're just in here. And philosophy finds more and more refined ways of describing. What's in here? And what's in here is your brain. And your brain is the key. We just have to work out, no, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, it's just a really cool thing that's in your head. What matters is what's out there, right? And um, attending to that and trying to describe that. That's what, um, that's what art, that's all that art at its best tries to do. Reminds me of a quotation by Wittgenstein. He says, one of the gravest philosophical mistakes you can make is to think that you think with your head. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But we need to... Uh, they, they wave here in, in order to stop us. Okay. Because we'll, we'll modernity stop. has to go on. <laughs> But uh, the conversation, of course, can continue between us and uh, forth and back. Or are you closing down the place? I thought we were going to go and eat fish. <laughs> uh, <coughs> um, thank you very much, Simon. Tack, Amen. Uh, fantastisk uh, forestilling for oss som fick lov til å være. Takk til dere som ville komme. Um, uh, det er noe som venter på oss, tror jeg. Something waiting for us out there. I think it is Ludafisk or something like that. Ludafisk? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> um, så minning på at på fredag... Så har vi et nytt foredrag her eh, om eh, bullshit jobs, eller meningen med arbeid. Det er en dansk version som skal til pers. Det er Anders Fogg Jensen, filosofen som kom og skrev en bok om pseudoarbeidet. Og det er Sven Egil Omdal og Ingeborg Eliassen som skal være kommentator på fredag. Og så er det Sakprosa-festival for tredje gang på lørdag. Starter her klokka halv ett, klokka tolv på Sølberget. Vare hele dagen og langt ut over kvelden, og eh, jammen dukker Simon Critchley up again on Saturday. He will be talking to a uh, former captain of the national team of Norway, who has been playing uh, against Liverpool, I think, uh, a team that uh, this philosopher uh, regards very high, I think. A, a topic we uh, <laughs> deliberately avoided. Yeah, <laughs> I think so, yeah. And uh, I know Breda, he is looking <laughs> forward to this uh, talking to you, Simon, because... I'm looking forward to talking to him. He read your book and he was up here. Oh, yeah? yeah. And a, he is high. He's a giant. Yeah, he's, yeah, a, yeah, giant. he's a giant. <laughs> So, thank you very much uh, for today, people. It's uh, looking forward to see you again on Friday, and thank you. Thank Clap you. hands.